Welcome to the Bless Carlo Akutas Project teaching videos. In this week's teaching video, we are looking at sections from the Catechism book 1.34 to 1.42. Uh, so just before we begin, Father Eamon, you might like to lead us in prayer and we will go ahead with the questions. In the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we'll turn to Our Lady now the mother of God and our mother. She's also called the seat of wisdom. So we'll ask her to share her wisdom with us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, mother, mother of, God, of God, pray, pray for, us, for sinners, us sinners now and at, and the, at hour the hour of, of our, our death. death. Amen. Amen. Father, so Holy Spirit. Thanks, Father Eamon. So I'll just start us off with maybe an introductory question because this week's topics cover a broad range from suffering and the presence of evil in the world and looking at Our Lady as well and her important role in the church. So maybe just to begin, a question that can be quite common pertaining to God and the existence of suffering and evil in the world. So one of these questions might be the world we live in has a lot of blessings. There's great happiness but there is also great suffering in the world. So people might ask, well, we look to God and we thank him for the many blessings we see around us. But then what do we do in terms of when bad things happen? So Father, I mean, you might. Well, we can look to the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. And in that book, God creates the world as a very, very good world. In fact, he created a paradise for Adam and Eve. He wanted them to be very, very happy. And they were very happy. They were in harmony with with each other there was harmony everywhere now what happened then was Adam and Eve sinned they fell into temptation and it was only then that, that they lost complete happiness that there was disorder came into the world suffering came into the world and death but the primary thing to remember about that book of Genesis is that God is good God is all good and he made the world to be a happy place a paradise for Adam and Eve so the question we might ask ourselves is why did God allow this suffering to come into the world after they fell? Well, in one way, the, the suffering was a punishment for their sin. He banished them from the garden, the garden of Eden, the paradise. They had to learn that sin has consequences, that bad things arrive out of sin. And the only way he could teach them this lesson was to introduce a little bit of suffering, just to teach them that lesson that sin has consequences. The other thing that suffering teaches people is that when they suffer, they reach for God more, they reach for help more. Great. Thanks, Father Eamon. Yeah, so just to be clear on that as regards suffering is a, a consequence of, of sin, the original sin, I suppose we can say. Yes, Eileen, suffering only came into the world after Adam and Eve sinned. But this doesn't mean that everyone who suffers is a great sinner. Jesus, after all, was innocent and he suffered, but he suffered because of the sins of others. This is called righteous suffering. And many of the saints of the church, uh, the martyrs, for example, they were persecuted, though they were innocent. So not all suffering means that the person uh, has been a great sinner. God sometimes asks holy people to carry a cross and bear sufferings as a sacrifice for the salvation of others. You know, some people might consider God a cruel God, that he might in some way enjoy seeing human beings suffer, but that is not, not at all the case. People say, why doesn't God just stop the suffering? But he can bring good out of the suffering, because when people suffer, it's clear to them that they need to turn to God. So he can bring good out of suffering, and he, he often does bring good out of suffering. Very good. Thanks, Father Eamon. And uh, so that leads us on to the next big question, uh, which is covered in the Catechism book as well, is that what about death then? Where did that come from? And uh, what should be our, I suppose, understanding or, or feeling about the whole area of debt? Mm. From the book of Genesis, we know that God didn't intend human beings to, to die at all intended them to uh, to live forever in fact without death that wasn't in his original plan but then when man sinned when adam and eve sinned god did introduce death and the reason he did this was to limit the the arrogance and pride that human beings after sin would have can you imagine eileen if we didn't die at all how arrogant would we would be 
But death, because there is death in the world now, death is a great leveler. It really puts manners on us. We see our mortality and we know then how feeble we really are. If there wasn't any death now that we are sinners, we would think that we were gods. We would think that we would be immortal and that we don't need the true God. But here's the good thing, Eileen. Death can be a rebirth as well. So when God did introduce death, he saw it as, as a means to a rebirth. And if we do imitate the way Christ died, and if we can make our death, whenever it comes, as an offering to God, we can have that rebirth, and he will give us new life, eternal life with him in heaven. So we shouldn't be afraid of death. If we think of Blessed Carlo Acutis, he was diagnosed with leukemia at age 15. He took it very bravely. His faith taught him that there is life after death. He believed in the resurrection of Jesus. He believed firmly that he would have new life after death. So our next question now is from one of our student participants, St. Columbanus. Some people think that God is unfair, that God could not be a good God if he allows people to get sick. How can we understand this? So Father Eamon, that's a very good question and an important question to look at um, surrounding God's goodness and uh, why are people allowed to become sick, for example? Uh, so God has allowed uh, many different types of sufferings and hardships and, and sickness, as St. Columbanus mentions there, um, into the world so that we human beings would reach out to him in our need and to draw good then from that suffering. And that, that's happened over the centuries for Christians. Christians have been persecuted quite a lot. There's been many martyrs. And God uses their suffering to purify their souls, to strengthen their souls. He purifies us with suffering like, like gold in a furnace. And if you think of our Lord on the cross, his complete offering of himself in suffering uh, led to his resurrection. And he received a glorious body in his resurrection. Very good. Yeah. And I like the um, image you used as well about the gold and the purifying fire uh, that with God's strength, uh, we have nothing to fear and that his protection is with us. And most of all, that he loves us. And uh, so Father Eamon, another question here, which probably ties in a little bit with this, but why doesn't God stop evil things from happening? I would say that God does stop evil things from happening quite a lot. You know, when Jesus came in the Gospels, uh, he healed a lot of sick people and he, he banished a lot of demons from people. So he, he did a lot of good. He calmed the storm. So God does do a lot of good and he does wipe away evil quite often. And you know, when we bring a child for baptism, that baptism wipes away original sin and confession wipes away sins. So he does all the time, I think, a lot more than we notice. You know, he has given us all a guardian angel to guard us all day long. To that question, why doesn't God wipe away evil? He does wipe away evil. So he does it in his own time. He does it slowly. There's still plenty of evil in the world that he is going to deal with. But he is going to deal with it. Jesus said that he will come again and bring all things to justice. Yes, and I suppose the Bible, we find lots of examples of that. And even in the Psalms, uh, the comfort that, you know, the author of the Psalms discovered. Often we see that towards the end of any particular Psalm where they're rejoicing and giving thanks to God on a personal level for the good that God has done or how he has restored a situation. Uh, so that's important too. And um, well, as you said there as well, um, I like that line in scripture where it says, I will make all things new so that we have that great promise, as you said, when Jesus says he will come again. Uh, there's, a lovely, there's a lovely parable that Jesus gave as well, Eileen. His parable is of a farmer and a farmer's workers. And there's this field and it, it's supposed to be growing wheat. And the workers approach the farmer and they say, look at the field. It's full of wheat, but it's also full of weeds. And they mm -hmm. say to the farmer, can we not pull up all the weeds straight away? And the farmer says, uh, not straight away, wait until harvest time. If you go pulling up all the weeds, you're likely to pull up the wheat as well. So that was the patience of the owner of the field. So in the same way, God is patient. He will deal with all the evil in the world, uh, but in his own time. 
Lovely. Thanks, Father Eamon. I, I love imagery anyway and um, metaphors, but that one with the wheat and the darnel and it's great and the weeds. Uh, so the next question, uh, Father Eamon, is um, so one of the truths of our faith is that God is a God of love. Uh, so does, but in relation to that then, does God punish sins? God is a very fair God, a very loving God. He's always calling people back to himself with love and mercy. But when he has to, he will punish and he does punish sins. And that's for our own good. Imagine if he didn't punish sins. Imagine how much wickedness there would be in the world then if he didn't punish sins. Just turn back to God, be reconciled to God through confession, and you will find that your relationship with God is even stronger than it ever was even before you sinned. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, as you said, as a father who loves us, so uh, it's always trying to bring us back uh, as we would use the analogy of a mother or a father with their child. If their child falls instinctively, a mother or father will run to the child to pick them up. And that's how it is with God. Um, so our next question, Father Eamon, then is what exactly is evil anyway? And did God uh, create evil? God didn't create evil. Evil is not actually something in itself. Now, evil does exist, but it's not something in itself. If you think of darkness, what is darkness? It's the absence of light. So it's darkness isn't something in itself. It's the absence of something, the absence of light. Or if you think of a hole in the ground that you want to avoid, you want to walk around. What is a hole in the ground? It's an absence of something solid. So evil is like that. It's the absence of goodness. So no, it's not the case that there is some other evil God out there uh, in opposition to the good God. That's not the case. There is only one God and he is a good God. So evil doesn't exist in itself. It just happens when we stop being good. Okay, very good. Thanks, Father Eamon. And that leads in now to our next question uh, from our student participant as well, uh, St. Columbanus. Do demons exist like the ones in the horror movies? So, Father Eamon, how do you respond to that question uh, from St. Columbanus? Do demon demons exist like the ones in the horror movies? So, yes, demons exist like you see in the horror movies, but demons will flee when we use holy water. So they are, after all, creatures of God. Even the devil himself, uh, he is only a creature of God. He's a fallen angel. So when we use holy water... Even when we say the Hail Mary, the demons will flee uh, at the sound of her name, the Blessed Virgin Mary's name. Or if we say the Our Father prayer, in the second half of that prayer, we have deliver us from evil. Amen. So Christians have nothing really to worry about with demons or horror movies. What Christians have in their prayer life, in the sacraments, that's much, much stronger than any evil force. The only time that demons will trouble us it's when we give in to when we give in to sin, when we give in to temptation. Yeah, so well, I suppose that yeah, as you said there, Father even that emphasizes the importance of uh blessing ourselves, even uh simple things we do every day, like the sign of the cross and how powerful that is. And uh the power of God anyway, that it's we don't have to fear anything. Mm -hmm. Or the name of the name of our Lord himself, you know. If you say short, quick prayers throughout the day, something like, uh, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. That will keep you safe from all evil. Or if you turn to the saints and you say, St. Joseph, pray for us. Uh, St. Patrick, pray for us. Again, that will have a shield around you that will protect you from any harm. Beautiful. And there's a lovely prayer by St. Patrick, of course, uh, Christ be with me, Christ be beside me, before me, behind me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that emphasizes uh, it's the more important way to focus on being always in God's presence, which is the most powerful. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other saints we should mention in this regard, as we are talking about demons, we have archangels and angels to protect us. St. Michael is one of the more famous archangels. And he is always depicted with a sword in his hand. If we lead a holy life and pray often, we have nothing to fear. 
Lovely. Thanks, Father Eamon. And so our next question now is geared towards young people as well. Uh, so to young people living in the world uh, that has a mixture of good and evil in it, what is your advice? Yeah, as we said at the beginning, God created a good world. He is a good God. He's all good. He wanted us to be happy, to be free, to enjoy his creation. So as Christians, we should enjoy life. Uh, we should um, give thanks to God for our very existence and love being alive. God wants all that. He wants us to be very, very joyful and happy. He wants us to be joyful in our religion. But Eileen, there, there are temptations in the world. There are lots of temptations for, for young people. And in fairness to blessed Carlo Acutis, he was, he was well aware of the path he should follow. And he took that path. He took the right path. And he avoided some of the temptations that teenagers would face. There's people trying to take away young people's innocence. Our innocence that God has given us is one of our greatest sources of happiness. But if our innocence is taken away from us, if people put on our screens something immoral, uh, or pornographic movies, for example, an awful lot of happiness and peace is taken away from a young person. But as Christians, if we obey God's commandments, if we have St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin Mary as our model and Blessed Carlo and all the great saints, we can live truly happy lives, joyful lives, and we will be strong in mind. Amen. Very good. Thanks, Father Eamon. Yes. And that's what God desires is for us to be happy. And, uh, you know, the way he leads out for us is to lead us to fulfillment in a way that gives us a truly human life and the happiest life. Uh, so now the next part of this section that we are looking at in the catechism book uh, looks at Our Lady um, and some lovely, uh, I suppose, words around Our Lady's role in the church in particular. Uh, so this next question, Father, even kind of speaks to that um, within the book. It speaks about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And can you tell us why she is so important in the church? You know, children thrive with a mother. In the natural life, children need mothers, but it's the same in the in the spiritual life. And God knew this, so God made a role for her, a very important role for her, uh, to be firstly the mother of Jesus, but also uh, the mother of all the baptized, um, and that she would actually uh, teach, guide, protect as a mother would, and and give love as a mother would, just as she gave to Jesus. Furthermore, then, she is, she is a model of so many virtues. She's a model of, of faith. She's a model of love. She's a model of purity. Uh, she's beautiful. She's a shining example of what a disciple of Christ is. How much God has put at our feet uh, of good and of blessings and um uh, so many reminders as well just to emphasize his presence in our day and i suppose all we need then is just to open up the eyes and the ears of our hearts to his uh, mm. constant goodness that is with us every day his love and um his mother <laughs> mm -hmm. as you say like what a comfort and a blessing that is that we can say we have these wonderful friends in our spiritual life mm. uh, that just keep us going and uh, make it such a fulfilled uh, joyful life um the blessed virgin mary she is like a perfect example of what God had intended with his creation. Can you imagine if everyone was as perfect and as beautiful as her? Beautiful. Thanks, Father Eamon. And uh, you just remind me of one quote, if I can, uh, from St. Paul as well, where he uh, describes, you know, how nothing in this earth can compare to the, the glory that awaits us in heaven. So, Father Eamon, our last question is, uh, what are the major feast days uh, to honour the Blessed Virgin Mary? I'll just mention three feast days um, in which we honor the Blessed Virgin Mary. The first is the first of January, the first day of the year. That's called the Solemnity of Mary, the Mother of God. The next one I'll mention is the 15th of August. This is the feast of the Assumption of Our Lady, body and soul into heaven. It's the, the dogma, the belief that when Our Lady, when her time on earth came to an end, when she died, she was taken up body and soul into heaven, that her body didn't become corrupt. She was so pure in body and, and soul that she was taken up into heaven, assumed into heaven. And the, the last feast then 
that I'll mention is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. That's the 8th of December. So this is the belief that when Our Lady herself was conceived in the womb of her mother, Anne, that she was conceived without sin. This was a great privilege uh, that she was given by God, that she was without sin, without original sin, and she never did sin. Um, she, she is therefore a great model in, in purity for us. Great. Thanks, Father Eamon. And they're all beautiful feast days and uh, big feast days, of course, in our church as well. So uh, thank you for sharing on those. And um, and just as you started this uh, video with a prayer to Our Lady, it uh, just reminds us every day to uh, invoke our Blessed Mother Mary with us on the journey. And uh, we have a brilliant guiding heart in, and maternal hand uh, with us as well. So uh, uh, thank you, Father Eamon. Thank you, Eileen. So uh, have you any uh, concluding thoughts uh, for this video? So what I would say to the, the teenagers in the in the project is and just be brave and, and spend a lot of time pondering these big questions uh, and praying with our Lord for, for wisdom and understanding. That's what Blessed Carlo did. He was courageous. He wasn't afraid to be to be different, to speak differently to the others uh, in his class. And he is now a blesses. He has completed that journey. Beautiful. Thanks, Father Eamon. That's lovely. Uh, so maybe you would like to close out the video uh, for all those who will be watching as well uh, with a prayer and uh, just for every blessing to be upon the students as well. In the name of the Father and of the Son, of the, Holy, the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, assist me now and in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, may I be forth my soul in peace with you. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Father Amen. Thank you, Eileen. Scripture verses relating to our topic. The Book of Genesis, Chapter 1. Verse 31, God saw all he had made, and indeed it was very good. Psalm 145, the Lord is kind and full of compassion, slow to anger, abounding in love. How good is the Lord to all, compassionate to all his creatures. The Book of Wisdom, chapter 1, verse 13, death was not God's doing. He takes no pleasure in the extinction of the living. The letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 18. As one man's fall brought condemnation on everyone, so the good act of one man brings everyone life and makes them justified. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him renounce himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die.